How we are? How are you today? This is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel with a program devoted to painting and drawing from life. And it's a scene today, as usual, a nice scene from our local area. Actually, it's Flanders. And uh, Flanders is on the eastern end of, of the island, as you know. And there is a place called Flanders Bay. And there is also Reeves Bay, a smaller one. And this is Goose Creek, which um, has got a rather amusing name. But it's also a very beautiful spot, no matter what time of year it is. And here it's been caught um, by the uh, TV camera camera in, in a state of uh, continuous uh, freeze. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure how often Goose Creek freezes over, but it is obvious that it is certainly frozen at this point. Um, seeing as how they call this the 100-year freeze, I believe that uh, any part of this island that has water has experienced probably excessive freezing. The, the painting is um, devoid of verticals, which is what I'm always talking about, the compositional qualities of a, of a painting has to be involve many elements. However, if a vertical is missing, there is a great drama in the uh, diagonals. And here, the, almost the entire painting is foreground. Foreground is a dangerous area to fool with. It can ruin a picture. So foreground is interesting, too, because you're right there looking at it, and then everything seems to fade off into the distance. And on this particular uh, subject matter, there is virtually no sky. The horizon is extremely high uh, on, the, uh, on the composition, and uh, the guideline, of course, has got to be the horizon line. If it's a little bit shaky, it doesn't matter, because it's going to get painted over anyway. But here is, the, here is the composition number one, sky and land. Uh, the um, the interruptions of these of this of that line takes place with a little land mass over here with a sort of a gentle diagonal uh, causing the first um, the first diagonal to lead the eye into the picture and then the other land mass is way off here way way up there in the distance uh, with a with a sort of a, obviously a, a wiggly line of some kind of uh, beach growth uh, beach is a um, in the wintertime is a sort of a contradiction. Uh, we always associate the beach area as the time when you can peel off most of your clothes and cavort about in the sun uh, and be warm. Uh, so when you see ice and accumulated snow on a beach, it is, uh, it's a contradiction. However, it's also extremely dramatic and uh, affords a tremendous amount of opportunity to study texture and uh, colors which you don't see all the time and um, no leaves and no grasses really to uh, divert the, the attention from the stark uh, composition of, a, uh, of an ice picture. Uh, many, many painters have um, uh, found it intriguing enough to do a life's work of, uh, of ice pictures. Um, Frederick Remington did not do a life's work but he certainly introduced ice and snow paintings to the West. Uh, to the Western art, and then a man called Frederick Church actually went up uh, before in the last century and painted the uh, uh, the Arctic in a series of absolutely remarkable studies of um, of ice formations and icebergs. So ice has been an intriguing element in painting for a very long time. Uh, however, not many people did it because it's uh, so extremely difficult to find yourself in that environment. However, uh, with the electronic uh, equipment of a television and a camcorder, you don't have to fight the elements anymore. You can get out there and record this on film and then in the comfort of a studio or a home or a 
corner in the, of the house, you can uh, do a very comprehensive study. When, uh, when the crew goes out, a crew of exactly one, goes out with a, uh, with a camera, uh, uh, the long shot is taken, which is the one that uh, is being seen right now on the monitor, and then the uh, close-ups are taken for a short period of time, sometimes five or six or seven minutes of a close-up. And uh, as the show progresses, you'll see that some of the close-ups of the boat and the ice formations have been taken for reference. Um, um, it, is, it is important that these references can do the focus, because when the human eye is out there focusing on it, uh, the eye has the ability to focus in no matter how distant it is, uh, either with sunglasses or with glasses or very good vision. But um, the camera can do it uh, with a zoom lens and that uh, makes it even more available in the way of detail. So we have here a layout of the boat lying uh, upside down. Uh, I don't know what that boat is worth. Um, it's worth something, but obviously it was caught either in a storm or left uh, to, well, to do whatever it's going to be doing until such time as everything thaws and releases it. I'm not sure it's frozen in place, but um, it certainly is there for a while. Nobody is going to go venturing out onto this spit of land. Uh, I'm told that there are houses all over the place, which uh, obviously they know that that boat is out there. Uh, it's, it's not really too much of my concern. I'm very concerned, very glad that it was there because it, it gives a nice uh, touch to the composition. Here are these great um, uh, ice, f um, well, formations, which are equally as difficult to paint as rocks. Uh, there is something very Mm, amorphous in the form of these of these uh, ice formations and they have to be rather closely observed and of course observation is my whole shtick with this uh, program I insist that people that observations be made remembered and then recorded because as a realist painter I want to make sure that uh, people are in, informed as to what they're looking at. The, um, the, uh, the, the worst part about it is to, to paint something and then have somebody not know what it is. So uh, for the most part, uh, the composition of this particular painting is in the whole complex design of this foreground, the boat and the ice flows, but then also I'm going to lay out, uh, it'll be painted over later, the, f the um, pattern of the different uh, colors of the ice out here. Some of it is um, pale and translucent, uh, snowy, and then uh, it, there, there's a, a rather wonderful looking sort of an uh, aqua and turquoise blue f form here that you find usually in the tropics. And this is a deeper blue and this is this nice aqua tone. And then the, um, the uh, elevation of, these, uh, of this ice formation here is throwing some wonderfully mauve and sort of purpley toned shadows uh, from, from the bank because the sun is obviously coming from here. here Here's another shadow, very clearly deline delineated on the, on the monitor, and that's going to give the third dimensional quality, whichever, which is what uh, you're after. So, with that much, uh, that much um, plan, uh, composition is nothing more than a plan. And without a plan, uh, there's probably no way of being able to get a comprehensive study done. Uh, it's like anything else needs a plan, whether it's a trip or a meal or a painting, you plan it. Uh, because uh, the uh, clarity that takes place in the uh, in the winter days, sometimes on Long Island, is uh, really very seductive, the uh, the blues can be absolutely uh, clear and. Um, pure, sometimes right out of the tube. What I'm doing here is mixing the color right on the canvas as I have done before and explained to you that the, uh, the need to uh, minimize the amount of equipment that is taken out on, on jaunts and trips is, um, is, is usually very important because uh, especially if you're going to uh, insist upon working in the wild, you're going to be carrying equipment. And that means that you have to, well, make sure that you don't carry on necessary stuff. A palette is almost unnecessary stuff. I use the canvas as my palette, uh, eliminates one piece of equipment. If you have to have a palette, there is usually a piece of driftwood or something on the beach that will give you, or a rock, will give you the ability to mix colors there on a palette. But to carry one, and besides it gets very messy and full of wet paint, and next thing you know you get it on clothes and car seats and, and so on. So uh, use the canvas as your palette. And maybe not, uh, as, a, as they might say, uh, too kosher, but uh, it's, uh, it works for me, and it just may be a tip that you are happy to, to latch on to from this program, which doesn't always uh, give you as many tips as a lot of others, but as many as I think are practical. Um, 
As I was driving up here to do these series of tapings for this particular month, I drove through Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania has been really clobbered with a tremendous amount of snow. And when the snow, of course, gets to be a foot and a half or two feet deep, it rests on everything. And the, um, the amusing part of it was this time when I came up, the barns, which are of course not, uh, not heated, uh, they all have great hats of snow on them, a uh, foot and a half uh, deep, sitting on the top of these wonderful old barns. Some of them are red, some are stone, some are white. And um, uh, the, if anybody is thinking of uh, chasing winter, uh, trying to go and see what winter is all about, all you need to do is to cross over New Jersey, head west to Pennsylvania, and see the, uh, the huge farms with, um, with their uh, very impressive uh, snow cover. Um, I'm going to smooth this out just a little. Well, that, that got a little bit stiff because it didn't get properly um, rinsed, uh, but uh, it, it, I can activate it rather well. When you put the, palette knife, the color on with palette knife, it covers a large area very quickly. And if you don't want the texture that the palette knife leaves behind, such as right here, that you can see it casts a slight shadow, you can smooth it out with a brush. A lot of people love the texture, some people love the smoothness. So it all depends as a matter of taste. I'm showing you both ways to do it. The texture of the palette knife is perfectly acceptable and so is the smoothness. There is no, there's no set formula for any of this stuff. Um, the land mass in the back uh, is, uh, is so distant and it's so, and it's so unclear that you don't try to make it any clearer than what you see it. Uh, you uh, simply follow what the information is out there. A lot of people say, I find it very hard to work from life because uh, it's difficult to reduce the thing in size. However, um, my, my answer to that always is that it's all there. The information is out there and you don't have to guess at anything. The information that I'm getting right now from that land mass is that it's sort of dark, a little bit indistinct, and it's very small, but it's there. It's the separation between sky and land. I'm using a small brush. I'm kind of insinuating that there are little, little bushes and growths out there. This is, a, this is the other side of Goose Creek, and uh, this is in the township of Riverhead. Uh, just north of here is the township, no, sorry, this, this is the township of Southampton, and just to the north of this is the township of Riverhead. Uh, just for just for location, not a, not a history, not a geography lesson. Just for the, so that the people who may be watching this, because cable uh, one, uh, cha uh, channel one has gone all the way on out to the eastern end of the island, and there are people who are picking this up for the first time. And um, I think that it's always rather exciting to be able to say, oh, that's I know I recognize that place right away. That's so and so. So here is um, here is uh, Goose Creek, and this land spit oh is the other side of it. Um, there is a there is a peculiar uh, anatomy to Long Island, and uh, what you see right here is pretty much the story. Uh, great expanses of sky, great uh, expanses of water, of course, on both coasts, and then uh, uh, the the weather is the other thing here that is so uh, so uh, easily found because. There are so many what I call blank spaces. Blank spaces are, of course, the beach. And um, you, you get very clear uh, pictures of these blank spaces. Here I'm going to apply with a palette knife some pure uh, white. This is MG's quick drying white. Uh, it's probably not visible to, uh, to you on the screen and is barely visible to me because it's going onto a white canvas. But it is in fact uh, got to be uh, shown as being uh, the snowy area that is covering that, uh, that land mass over in, in the distance. And um, the uh, slight texture that you get is sort of maybe the rise and fall of these uh, snow, of these uh, accumulations of snow. As I said a little bit earlier, snow and the beach are sort of a contradiction, but also extremely dramatic and, and, and mysterious in, in its own way. So here we have, uh, and Long Island is uh, apparently going to, uh, to experience, uh, just like all other parts of the uh, great northeast here, probably the worst winter in 100 years. Uh, there are some people who are saying that in 78 there was a heavy snowfall here, but I recall that uh, the, um, it was not quite as severe as this one. Uh, and it makes for some pretty nice compositions if you like snow paintings, uh, which I do because I love the, the low-key color scheme of it. Somewhere uh, way back there, there is, a, um, there is an introduction of some slightly darkish green, maybe some more 
things growing. Uh, sap green, a little touch of white, a touch of yellow is going to give you um, just the bare, barest suggestion of some growth over here. And uh, little, little, um, little islands in the middle of rivers and creeks are what make for this. And uh, some, some of them are, some of the beach plums, I understand, last for a very long time and remain green a good part of the year. So there is another uh, another element uh, of this uh, distance that we're trying to get into. I'm going to use a brush here to to remove some of the uh, uh, thick quality of this green that I have because I need to put some some pure white also on here. We're dealing with uh, the purity of color. If your if your color is not pure. Uh, you're going to lose the the general feeling that there is snow out there. There is also, um, I'm also using something called cobalt dryer. It's got a slight tone, a slight mauveish tone to it. It should be used only with dark colors, certainly not to reduce the consistency of white with this cobalt dryer because it's in this bottle and you can see it's a sort of a dark substance, but it's a wonderful dryer. And within a matter of hours, this will all be dry enough for, um, for either transporting or for, well, certainly not for varnishing, but for, but for transporting. So here we have, um, I'm putting, uh, putting this on with a brush. There is a sort of a mauveish tone to it because of that dryer. And way off there in the distance, uh, the, the beach uh, of, this, uh, of the land is, um, has got uh, ice clear up to its border. Um, the, uh, the, the, the um, texture of these paintings is what interests me. <clears throat> that some of it is uh, more um, textured because it's uh, grasses and rocks and ice, and some of it is water and ice and very smooth. So um, I, I kind of apply texture and technique with uh, the subject at hand. I think I'm going to take a very short break now uh, for just a few seconds, um, which is the pattern of this program. So don't go too far. I'll be right back. Here we are back again on the ice floes like little Nell and um, trying, to, uh, trying to pull off a composition uh, of uh, simple color, uh, simple, comp uh, simple lines, but also trying to make it convincing. Uh, how do you convince people that what they're looking at is a, um, is a formation of ice on the side of a beach? A lot of people don't ever get to see this. They don't go out into this kind of weather, probably very wise, except that uh, you miss a great deal of visuals. Uh, here is that green uh, little landmass sticking out there, and it's got snow on it. Uh, on, on its shoreline, uh, somehow the wind has prevented the snow from hitting it all over the place. It doesn't have its little cap of snow like I just to told you about the barns in Pennsylvania, because it's pretty windy out here a good deal of the time and um, uh, that's what makes the uh, that's what makes these ice formations I suppose so uh, dramatic and so in, in intriguing uh, to paint also to look at I, I don't think that there's anything quite as uh, as amazing as weather uh, and uh, nat nature as it were um, next thing you know this is going to be called uh, Pat Windrow's Wild America, because I keep talking about about the nature and the patterns that it makes, but that's because I'm the visual uh, painter, and um, in order to be the visual painter, you get out there and you see this stuff. 
All right, there is the, uh, there is a sort of an accumulation of snow. It's got a little bit of dark places. I'm not sure what those are, but they're, um, they're interesting enough to just sort of suggest that there, something is happening there. I don't know if they're rocks or if they're, they're, they're too far away to tell, but they certainly do um, introduce um, a break in the, uh, in the, in the continuous white of the snow. Whatever they are, they are, they are helping with the design. Um, uh, they are. They, they may be or may not be. Uh, they may or may not be all sorts of other things like flotsam and jetsam washed up on the beach. However, the close-up tells me that um, some of that uh, some of that green along the along the shoreline there uh, is is um, is a combination of um, cerulean blue and yellow green from the tube. It's a sort of amazing to think that because oh, I have been to Bermuda a number of times, and this is the color that you find in the tropics. However, it's happened here, and um, it makes for a it makes for a, a really nice uh, departure from the uh, from the ordinary greens and blues of Long Island. It gives a whole sort of different dimension, and there is a different dimension to this winter. I can guarantee that. I'm sure that anybody who's been out in it realizes that um, this is uh, this is an experience that we'll be talking about for a very long time. Um, it turns into uh, some uh, some uh, ultramarine, which is um, there are three different blues on my palette here. I've got ultramarine, cerulean blue, and Prussian blue. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the blending is what is going to make this uh, icy. Uh, it goes from one to the other, and I'm using a brush in order to do that. It turns from this wonderful turquoise aqua color into a darker blue, uh, and um, with a slightly grayish tone to it. And I'm, I'm hoping that when we sort of step back from this, that this is all uh, very clear. Um, yeah, however, you never really can tell whether you've, you're hitting it right until the, you step back and the whole picture is done. But the dark quality of the blue is is in this diagonal that I laid out before, and the blend takes place uh, by um, marrying the, the colors together. The, um, you can't do this with watercolor. This is, uh, this is strictly an oil technique uh, that, um, that happens because the blending of oil, oil colors uh, is possible over a period of time. With watercolors, um, you, the watercolor runs and it blends or it doesn't, and if you don't get it to blend, then, you have, um, then you've lost the ability to get the tones that run into one another. As you can see, this has to all be um, carefully blended and observed. The other color that's coming up now on this nice diagonal, and of course you understand that this is part one of, um, of the program because we never try to do a complete uh, painting of 14 by 18 inches in one sitting. This is the pale side, very pale. I believe that uh, just a touch of ultramarine on that um, on this uh, on this white is going to do it. It has to be extremely pale, and if I put too much, then you just uh, take some of it off. It's a little bit too dark. I'm not sure that uh, I think I have to go a little bit pale. So I'm going to scrape this off and reserve it on a part of my palette and just add some more white and see if I can see if I can get it properly there. The um, the need to uh, the need to mix colors in a subtle painting such as this is uh, is a well, as uh, the people would say sometimes, it's a crapshoot. Uh, you never really uh, know until you've mixed it and put it against the other one whether you've got it right. That looks to me as though it may be just sort of off enough. I think a touch of, a touch of mauve or a touch of purple is going to probably help this a little bit too. The, um, the screen may not be picking up this, the subtlety of that, but um, I certainly know it's there. So here we have, butting right up against the, um, uh, against the darker blue that's near the shoreline, is this nice uh, um, powdery surface of um, apparently some pretty thick ice. I wouldn't walk on it, but it looks like it might be uh, walkable. And um, it's, uh, it's covering a rather large area, uninterrupted, uh, of things except for some stripes of darker color going through it, and that'll come on in a moment. So uh, I'm laying the background for putting out the uh, stripes, or stripes, the the darker blue tones that are going across this nice big expanse of uh, heavy ice. I'm going to I'm going to um, sort of give that a little bit of of more uh, definitive meeting of the darker colors. And uh, believe me, uh, the uh, uh, programs that show people working out of their imagination is um, is okay. But there is no way that anybody could ever invent what is happening to this particular formation. You have to be there and see it or you have to at least record it and look at it and observe it very carefully. My whole uh, um, instructional 
uh, tenant, uh, posture is to observe and to record what you observe. Uh, that is absolutely vital, in my opinion, to this kind of realist painting. Here, over here, I'm using the color that I mixed because it, um, in a very subtle way, it has traveled around the corner and it's uh, and it's on the right side of the picture and running into that um, uh, spit of water here that is darker. Um, it's it's sort of beginning to look icy. But comes now the the need to, well, it's uh, actually as the time has gone by, this particular um, uh, area has become less wide than it was when we first started. That's why we know, uh, you know, that I'm working from something which is changing in pattern. I do believe that the uh, darker blue area has become a little bit wider as the few moments have passed. That's what happens when you're out there in the wild. Uh, things change because uh, that's the way it is. There is no, it, it's not a still picture, and I'm not copying a photo. I'm working from something which was taken from life. There's a lot of mauve in this um, in this next uh, tone, which is ultramarine, a touch of spectrum red, and see if I've got it dark enough with a swipe on here. I'll see if that's, it sort of seems dark enough, but maybe a little bit too brilliant. So mixing, mixing is the, um, is the point. Uh, there is no, um, there's no trick to it. It is, uh, and even I am still involved in the trial and error of mixing colors. Yeah, they don't come out of the tube. There is, uh, there is no such thing as tubes of color that say color of ice. You mix it, and of course, it's the circumstances under which you're working that you are able to um, find out just exactly what that color is. Pulling that tone across there is about as close, I suppose, as I, I ought to get to the uh, to the fact that that's what is on the um, that is the information that's being given to me on the monitor. There's another one that comes across here at something of an angle. And uh, the layering is what I'm always after. I'm always after the, uh, the understanding that this is a painting in layers, going from the furthest part uh, away from you, uh, working toward the foreground. Uh, these um, these uh, uh, techniques that I have are, uh, they are not, they're not really in books. They are my technique. If, they, if I can impart this kind of knowledge to you, fine. Uh, then you might be able to use them. My letters that come from people uh, tell me that um, what I'm doing is very clear and that they are getting something out of it and they're applying it to their own, uh, their own painting project. Um, when I'm on the live program, of course, I get phone calls from people and they tell me, they tell me that what, I, what I'm doing is giving them information that they haven't had before. So, I, I do believe that uh, time is probably running out and um, and uh, now is the time to tell you that part one of this Goose Creek uh, composition has um, come to an end. It's much too quickly, as usual. Uh, the second part will, com will conclude how you get this ice stuff in the front rendered in such a way that you believe what I'm telling you. Thanks for watching. Cable Easel Pat Windrow saying, see you next time. Bye.